Okay, great. Uh, let's. Um, are there any questions? First. Okay. Uh, so let's just quickly uh, review our schedule first and the announcements. For those of you who are here, uh, first of all, make sure you attend the the class on Thursday because some of this lecture may not be recorded because you have to uh, the, the the lecturer will work on the board. So it's important that you attend it if you want to learn about the light tools. So that's one. Uh, number two, again, um, uh, actually it's three. I mentioned the Lasson Center last week, uh, and here's the information if anyone's interested in doing prototyping for their project. This is free and it's available to you. So I highly encourage making use of this resource. Um, also, there's uh, this thing called the Lasson Center Seed Fund application. I was made aware of this recently, and it's uh, if you are interested in uh, in participating, it's due November third. And uh, again, I encourage you. None of these are mandatory, by the way. These are options available to you. Okay. So the most important announcement um, is that we have the midterm next Thursday. So make sure you're here on time and uh, the exam will be in class um, and you have to bring your own paper. Okay, I'm not, we're, we won't provide you the paper, we'll just provide you the exam itself. So make sure you bring your own paper. Uh, you have to write your name and staple it to the exam and hand it back to the TA. Uh, okay, and we will have a review on Tuesday, and uh, of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or the TA or message on Canvas. So make use of all the, uh, the uh, material that uh, resources available to you. And as I said before, last week, the midterm will cover everything we have covered and uh, we have studied until today. Uh, light tools won't be included, but everything until today's lecture. Uh, after fall break, uh, uh, we have some technical lectures, but also uh, we have some. We'll start working on the commercialization starting October 20th. So keep that in mind. Um, also, of course, you have the assignment to do on October 27th. Instructions for the assignment were posted last week up here. So make sure you're aware of that and start working on this. Okay. Uh, okay, and. Uh, the next time you will meet your technical mentors, of course, you're welcome to email your technical mentors anytime about your project to get feedback, but uh, I expect you to meet with uh, the mentors uh, the week of October uh, 18th or 17th, actually. Okay, so just also keep that in mind, which is the week after fall break, and this is primarily for you to get feedback on your assignment too. So my suggestion is to for you to prepare a draft presentation and present it to your mentor and get feedback from them. Okay, and starting November, we will start meeting with the commercialization mentors, which uh, I will assign these mentors in the next two weeks or so, and I'll provide their contact information, and you, you should uh, contact them as early as possible to set up the meetings, because they are usually pretty busy people. Okay, uh, first of all, are there any questions about this? Uh, yes, I heard that. So um, there will be five questions, uh, five or six. So I'm still kind of preparing it. Um, uh, yes, that's a good question. So five or six, um, but I will make sure that uh, you have enough time so you will have the entire time of the class to do the exam, so 12.25 to 1.45. Um, the questions, first of all, the exams are all open book, open internet, open everything, except that you cannot communicate with anyone else. So you have to do this yourself, but if you have to look something up, you can. So you can bring anything you want, calculators, whatever. But uh, keep in mind that I will not ask you to do a lot of mathematics or anything like that in the exam. I don't think that's useful uh, for for this class anyway but I will ask questions that are um, will make use of your understanding of the concepts or intuition okay uh, 
primarily focused on geometrical optics and non-imaging optics. Okay, uh, are there any other questions? Okay, all right, then let's, uh, let's begin. So today our um, goal is to complete uh, what we started last time on uh, non-imaging optics. So just to review, this is the second to last slide we ended on last time, uh, is this idea of the edge ray principle for non-imaging optics. And the principle is re relatively simple to understand. The idea is that if you take a ray of light that is coming from the edge of an object uh, or source or the sun in our particular case, and you make sure that ends up at the edge of one of the receivers. So you take one edge ray and send it here and take the other edge ray and send it here, as shown here. Then you can ensure that all the rays in between will always end up on the receiver somewhere. Okay, and of course you can do it on this side as well. We have only drawn on one side for clarity in this particular case. So that's the very basic concept. So just to reiterate, light rays coming from the edges of the source must be deflected onto the edges of the receiver. This is the basic design principle of non-imaging concentrators. So it's very critical that you understand. And the principle is simple to understand in this picture. So if you look at an edge ray, of course, you designed your co compound parabolic concentrator in order to send this ray to the edge of this receiver. And this ray, which is parallel to this ray, shown in dashed line, will end up, of course, at this edge of the receiver. Now, if you have a ray of light, which is coming in at an angle that is shallower than theta, which is, let's say, the acceptance angle, because it's the edge ray, theta 1 is less than theta, then it will ensure the, uh, the edge ray principle ensures that this ray will end up somewhere on the receiver. Okay? Up to the other side of theta. Now, if the theta incident angle, the angle here, is larger than the acceptance angle, then it will ensure that it will not end up at the receiver. In this particular case, it will bounce around until it escapes the system. So, in conclusion, what we are saying is that all rays entering the CPC with an input angle less than the acceptance, half acceptance angle theta are trapped and end up at the receiver, but all rays entering the CPC with an input angle greater than theta are lost or reflected back. Uh, of course, mathematically, this can be very simply expressed as, as an acceptance, which is defined as the ratio of the number of rays receiving the receiver, or that is accepted, divided by the number of rays entering the CPC. Now, as I said previously, in the ideal case, the acceptance is 1 or 100% of the rays are accepted when the input or incident angle is between minus theta and theta, where this theta is a half acceptance angle. So it goes on both sides. That's why it's minus and plus. Okay, so in other words, in this picture, it goes from theta here to a minus theta on this side. So you have a cone of angles. And if it's beyond that, in other words, if this theta i is beyond that acceptance angle, the acceptance value goes to zero. Okay, so it's 100% and then it falls to zero. Of course, this is the ideal case. In a real case, this is no, never, never true. And you will see some examples of this uh, in the lecture on Thursday, where you will see this is not exactly true. Okay, so you will actually talk about the CPC on Thursday, so make sure you, you pay attention. Okay. Now, let's uh, try to understand one important uh, property of uh, the CPC, which is related to a parabola. As I said before, each surface of the CPC is part of a parabola. So this is one parabola, this is another parabola. So let's just concentrate on, on, on one of these parabola, okay? And we, we flip it over and look at it this way. So it's, it's, it's plotted this way. Now, the light is coming in, let's say, at this, along these rays, A, C, and B, D. So the wavefront is essentially a plane shown by this dashed line. So the ray A, C, because it's coming straight down, will, of course, pass through the focus, because that is the property of the parabola, A, C, F. And the ray B, D, which is parallel to A, C, will also pass through the focus, F. Now, a pro an important property of the parabola is that the optical path length 
which is a, which is because this is air is the same as the physical path length is given by AC plus CF for this ray should be equal to every other ray that is parallel to it means BD plus DF so AC plus CF is equal to BD plus DF this is an identity a property of a parabola so we can now use this property in the case of the CPC now you will see why this is important in a second but let's apply it so okay let's apply it to this particular parabola okay this is a portion of a parabola remember it goes like way oops sorry it goes way down here but this part is chopped off so we are only concentrating here so a ray comes in ED and it goes to the focus. So the focus is this edge. Remember this edge of the receiver. A is the focus of this parabola. So focus A and the axis is of course parallel to BC. If you remember this whole parabola simply rotated 90 degrees from this. Okay. So this is the ray which now passes through the focus and this is the parallel ray which, which is just passing through here. Of course, it will also pass through the focus as we know, right? This will reflect off this and pass here, but this is parallel to the receiver, so it's not terribly important at this stage. We'll come to it. Now, now we are going to apply this principle, this identity of the parabola, okay? The way you apply it is very simple. So first, we have this ray, so we com compute the path length CB plus the path length BA which now we are going to call A2 because that's the size of the receiver. Okay, CB plus A2 is the path length of one of these rays from here to the focus. The other equivalent ray, remember this C and this E are equivalent because these are parallel rays and this is the face front, wave front, which is a plane. Okay, so E is the equivalent point for C. So we can start from E. ED plus DA is the path length of this ray. Okay, so we can say CB plus A2 is equal to ED plus DA. Just applying this principle of the parabola. Okay, now of course if you look at this, CB and DA are equal. Why? Because CB and DA are equal because this is a completely symmetric CPC, right? So in other words, this parabola is equal to this parabola, simply a mirror. So if you look at this line right here, it should be equal in length to this line right here. Okay, it's just some simple geometry. So in this equation, I can cancel these things up, CB and DA. Now I cannot come with a very simple expression, A2, which is the same size as the receiver, is equal to ED. Now if you look at this right angle triangle, C, D, E, now we can say DE is equal to A1, which is this line right here, CD, or it is the size of the input aperture multiplied by sine theta. Okay, so A2 is now equal to A1 times sine theta. In other words, A1 divided by A2 equals 1 over sine theta. Now this is profound. Why? Because A1 divided by A2 represents the magnification of the system or the concentration factor of the system. A1, remember, is the input aperture. A2 is the receiver. So A1 divided by A2 is how much you have concentrated the light. But this is telling you something very interesting, is that the concentration factor here is equal to 1 over sine of the theta. Now what is theta? Theta is the acceptance angle. It is the angle at which the, the edge ray is coming into the system. And this is the largest angle that you can expect to collect. So what this is saying is as you increase the concentration, A1 over A2, no, if you make A1 very large and A2 very small, the sine theta has to decrease. In other words, you can start collecting only over smaller and smaller acceptance angles. So higher the geometric concentration, lower the acceptance angle. 
And the consequence of that is that if you build a concentrator photovoltaic system, for example, which has huge concentration, let's say a thousand times concentration, it means that you can only collect rays coming at a very narrow acceptance angle, which means that you need to track the sun extremely precisely. Your tracker becomes expensive. Okay, so this is why this relationship is important and profound for, for, for us. Okay, we'll come back to this. Now, of course, keep in mind, all of this was under the assumption this is two-dimensional, right? So because we didn't consider the third dimension, we assumed that this is basically a slice. Uh, when you consider the third dimension, this is slightly different, and we will talk about that as well. So just keep that in mind. So just to reiterate, the basic concept here that we have applied to derive this very simple expression, but very simple but very important expression, is that the optical path length between the wavefront CE, which is this, and the focus A is the same for all edge rays perpendicular to CE. So this is a ray perpendicular to CE, another ray perpendicular to CE. Okay? Relatively simple idea, but very important idea. Okay, so let's see how we can apply this to understand the geometry of the CPC further. So, the next question, of course, to define the CPC, we not only need the A2 and A1, we also need to know how tall it is. So let's see how we can do that. And again, a simple geometry. So in this case, let's draw the symmetric diagonal lines or the edge rays on two sides. Okay, and then let's define the height H1 from the top here to this intersection point and H2 from the bottom here to this intersection point. So the total height here, H, of the CPC is H1 plus H2. Okay. Now, H1, just from this right angle triangle, can be shown as A1 divided by 2, which is this base of this right angle triangle, divided by tangent of theta. In other words, tangent of theta over 2. Sorry, not tangent of theta. Sorry, tangent of theta, because this is the acceptance angle, half acceptance angle. So this is theta. Tangent of theta is A1 divided by 2 divided by H1. So H1 is A1 divided by 2 divided by tangent of theta. Okay? And the same way you can write H2, and this because this is also theta, as A2 divided by 2 divided by tangent of theta. So now you can relate H to the receiver size or the aperture size, input aperture size. In this case, let's write it in terms of the input aperture size. A1 is 1 plus sine theta over 2 tan theta. This 2 comes from this 2. Okay, This sine theta comes out because of this relation here. A1 equals A2 divided by sine theta or A2 equals A1 sine theta. So in other words, we can replace this A2 as A1 times sine theta. So with simple geometry, you get this expression. So now you have defined everything that you need to know for the geometry of the, of the CPC. In other words, if I ask you now, okay, design a CPC whose magnification factor is 100, okay, and whose height is, let's say, one centimeter, or, or let, me ask, uh, let me rephrase this question. Design a CPC for a solar cell, which is one centimeter, who, whose geometric concentration factor is 100. You should be able to do this now. now. How would you do this? Let's walk through the steps. So let's say the solar cell is one centimeter. So that's A2. And I told you the concentration factor is 100. That means I now I know the input aperture is A1 is 100 times 1 centimeter. So that's 100 centimeters here. So I know A1 and A2. The only thing I need to know is H. Okay, and H I can compute from here. Uh, well, then I need to know theta. How do I know theta? Because from this expression, A1 over A2 is 100 is 1 over sine theta. So I can ex get theta from that. So theta is approximately 1 over 100 is 0 0.01. And then you can plug that in here. You know A1 and you get H. So you can define the entire CPC just by the information I just told you. 
Okay, so you should be able to do very simple questions like that. Now, intuitively, it's also important for us to understand what happens. So if I increase magnification, of course, I'm making A1 large for a given A2, which means that my acceptance angle theta is starting to go down, okay? Which means uh, as theta goes down, this H starts to go up. Okay, this is by the way a mistake, so I need to, I forgot to correct this, but this should be theta going down, H goes up. In other words, if I go to infinite magnification, okay, let's, let's imagine this became extremely large, then of course this means that time theta goes to extremely small, becomes almost zero. That means theta goes to zero, which means if you look at this expression, this theta also goes to zero, that means h now goes to infinity. Okay, so you can imagine as you increase the concentration factor, the CPC gets very, very, very tall. And of course, acceptance angles is very, very, very small. Okay, and these are the trade offs that you have to keep in mind. They're relatively simple, but I want you to understand the constraints. Here. Okay, so so far we have only talked about the CPC as an ideal concentration in 2D and we will show in the next few slides that it is actually theoretically the ideal concentrator in 2D but in 3D uh, you can imagine the CPC to have two options of 3D one is you could make a little square aperture as shown on the left here or you could just rotate it to make a paraboloid uh, or a section of a paraboloid to, to make a CPC like this. So both of these are possible. But it, in both cases, it can be shown that it is not theoretically the best concentrator. In other words, some of the rays which come in at what's called skew angle, which means it's not, the angle is, the rays are not parallel to any of these planes. They come in at some strange angle. They can, even if they're within the acceptance angle of the CPC, they can be lost and some outside rays can get in. Okay, which means that the acceptance function, which used to be 100% for rays that are within the acceptance cone and 0% for rays outside the acceptance cones, now becomes a little less selective. Okay, and you will see the example of this uh, in the Light Tools tutorial on Thursday. Okay, now, and we don't need to know in great detail about how to model these, but only need to know some uh, intuitive ideas of how to design these. Okay, now um, I want to spend some time uh, doing a little bit of geometry to understand the properties of the CPC. Again, the goal here is not to get overwhelmed by the geometry or the mathematics, but really to gain some intuition as to how a CPC behaves under different conditions and why it behaves in a certain way. Okay, so that's the main goal here, so keep that in mind. Let me uh, stop and ask if there are any questions at this point until now. Okay, great. So, uh, let's look at how we made the claim originally when we began this lecture that the CPC is an ideal concentrator in 2D. So, let's first understand why this is the case. Okay. To really understand this, we need to look at an example as drawn in this diagram. It's a little bit abstract, so, so bear with me and try to try to follow. So first, let's imagine the space is at zero Kelvin. Okay, this is space, basically everything is shown in white. And imagine we have a cylindrical black body. So this is cylindrical, which means that this is a cylinder that extends for infinity. Okay, and this cylindrical black body has some temperature T capital T. And the cylindrical black body has a radius, cross-sectional radius of small r, and uh, yeah, and it let's look at one unit length, LU equals one of the cylinder. Of course it's infinite, but we're only going to look at one, one unit length here. Okay, and this cylinder is of course, because it's a black body, so it's radiating in all directions. Now we're going to follow one of uh, these directions out to here where we have a cylindrical surface okay at a distance d of course this is a huge wavefront it's a cylindrical wavefront it's all around but we're only going to concentrate on this little piece here okay 
And on this little piece, we are going to put a CPC uh, or some kind of concentrator. Actually, let's not call it a CPC. Let's just call it some general concentrator, okay? Because we are trying to understand the limits here. We don't really care what the actual geometry is. We're going to apply thermodynamics. So, of course, this is a two-dimensional system because this is infinite and we are going to apply a two-dimensional concentrator which has infinite in that direction. So, we can also call it a linear concentrator. Okay. Now, now let's apply some basic principles of thermodynamics that we've already learned. First, what is the total flux emitted by a black body of area dA at temperature T into a hemisphere? Of course, we know we can compute the total flux from what's called the Stefan Boltzmann law, which says that the total flux is given by the Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma multiplied by t raised to 4, the fourth power of the temperature of the black body, multiplied by the area of the black body, dA. Okay? Now, the area of the black body is easy to compute. That's the black body. The area is simply the air surface area of the cylinder, which is 2 pi r, the radius of the cross-section of the cylinder, times LU, the length of the cylinder. We are going to consider LU equals to 1, so that drops off, so you just have 2 pi r. So dA is simply 2 pi r times LU, but we are going to make that 1. So it's simply uh, our black body of length LU basically emits 2 pi r sigma t raised to 4 LU, but if you say LU is 1, that is the black flux emitter per unit length is 2 pi r sigma t raised to 4. Sigma is, of course, the second Boltzmann constant. Okay, so far so good. This is something that should be clear to all of us because we've done this before. Now we need to look at the other end. What happens over here where we are trying to uh, accept the light, okay, or collect the light. Now, if we look at what happens here, instead of drawing this in three dimensions, we are going to take a slide here. So because this is of course a two-dimensional object, because it's infinite in the other dimension, we're going to just draw it in two dimensions as a slice. Okay, and that's shown here. You can think about it almost like a top view. So that's our big black body source. It's infinite out of the plane of the screen. Okay, it's emitting in all directions, and we are going to look at this cylindrical surface at a distance d away. Okay, where we have placed some kind of a linear concentrator, also infinite out of the plane. Now, the input aperture of this concentrator is A1. The output aperture of this concentrator is A2. Okay? Now, now we can compute the flux or the amount of radiation the entrance aperture A1 receives per unit length. Okay? Per unit length meaning per unit length in this direction. Okay? Because, so... Um, uh, sorry, per unit length in the direction orthogonal to the screen. So that's that's what that means because it's infinite. So if you can compute in unit length, you can compute in any, any, any length. Which, of course, is equal to the flux that is emitted from the black body, which is, of course, spread over the entire cylindrical surface di divided by how much is intercepted by the aperture of this. Okay, so two, so sigma t raised to four, two pi r, was the uh, uh, the flux that was emitted per unit length from this black body. Now, if we divide it, of course, it also has to be because it is spread over this entire hemis uh, cylindrical surface, that is two pi d, which is this big big hemispherical surface. So you have to divide it by two pi d. Okay, 2 pi d being the perimeter of this big uh, circle over which the flux is uh, spread. So this total flux is spread over this circle in two dimensions. You multiply that by the fraction of the area of the input aperture of the CPC that makes up the circle, which is A1. Okay, so sigma t raised to 4 times 2 pi r divided by 2 pi d, which is the flux per unit length on the circle, times A1, the length of the aperture here. So this is the fraction of the flux coming from this black body that is intercepted by this concentrator. 
Okay, now so far we haven't said anything about this concentrator, we're just talking about the flux. Now, let's assume that there is a black body that absorbs this radiation at the exit aperture A2. Let's say we place, uh, there's an exit aperture A2 and we place something here, an absorber, like a solar cell or some black body. Okay, we don't need to specify what it is because we can just apply thermodynamics. The temperature of this black body has to be less than T, okay, because it's not, uh, uh, of course, if it's more than T, that means we will, you won't absorb it, you will lose energy, so we're going to make the assumption it's less than T, like a solar cell. At equilibrium, okay, at a thermodynamic equilibrium, it will be capital T. So after, if you give enough time, and those are the two only two objects in the universe, given enough time, this uh, receiver will, of course, reach the same temperature as this black body T. Okay, under this situation, then the black body, this black body here, which is a black body receiver, will also emit radiation with flux per unit length, given again given by Stefan Boltzmann law of sigma times a two, the area per unit. Uh, this is per unit length, of course, area of this receiver times t raised to four. Okay, now what's beautiful about thermodynamics is under thermal equilibrium. The flux that is intercepted at the input of this aperture and the flux that is emitted from the output of this aperture, assuming it's only emitted in one direction, is should be equal because if they're not, they will be in, uh, not at the same temperature. Okay, so in other words, the flux that's intercepted by the input of the concentrator and the flux that is emitted by the absorber at the bottom of the concentrator should be equal. These two numbers should be equal, equations should be equal. And if you make them equal, again, you get this beautiful simple expression. Sigma of course cancels off, t raised to 4 cancels off, and you will see that a1 r over d equals a2, or a1 a2 over a1 equals r over d. r over d, if you look here, it's nothing but sine theta. Sine theta is r over d. And theta is now the edge ray. Remember, this is the edge ray coming from the edge of the object. Okay, so we basically are able to derive the expression for the maximum, for the relationship between the acceptance angle and the concentration factor, which is a1 over a2 without assuming anything about the concentrator itself, just by applying pure thermodynamics principles. Okay? And you get the same expression that A2 over A1 equals sine theta, or A1 over A2 equals 1 over sine theta, which is exactly the same as what we derived for the CPC using completely different methods. So there is only one conclusion, which is that the CPC does the best possible concentration, at least in two dimensions. You cannot beat thermodynamics. This is the best you can do, and CPC does this. So that means CPC is the best you can do, at least in two dimensions. Okay? So just to summarize, what we have basically shown uh, is that if you look at an, at, at the universe where the uh, everything is at zero Kelvin, radiation leaving A1 which is the entrance aperture of the CPC, of, of, of any concentrator. And this is, of course, coming from a receiver placed at A2 and can only be headed to the source, SR, because there's nothing else in, the, in this particular universe. This implies that the acceptance angles of the CPC with the entrance aperture A1 cannot be larger than theta. Right? Of course, it's obvious when you look at the geometry, there cannot be any larger angle than theta coming into the CPC just from this object. Okay, now you can also see intuitively as d becomes very large, in other words, you move this object far and far away for a constant theta, assuming that this angle theta half acceptance angle becomes, remains constant. And this, uh, which basically means that r, as d increases, r also increases. So the ratio r over d is the same. So it becomes a huge object. Then a1 essentially becomes a straight line. So instead of being this being a circle, this becomes a straight line. 
and the concentrator concentration factor becomes a1 over a2 is 1 over sin theta just like we saw in the last class so as I say in the last slide sorry so this is the maximum possible concentration for 2d and this is the same as CPC so the CPC gives the maximum possible concentration in 2d okay again it's not important that you're able to prove this but I want you to intuitively appreciate what the way uh, we computed it in two ways one was using thermodynamics where we made no assumptions about the geometry that the other was using completely only geometric arguments just based on the property of the parabola and they both give you the same answer so just appreciate the two methods okay now, of course, the, what we have talked about so far is only two dimensions. A, in reality, everything is three dimensions, so we need to understand what this means. So let's think about this. Of course, it's more complicated, and we have to visualize this. So let's try to do this carefully. First, of course, the source, instead of being a cylinder, becomes a sphere. Okay, again, temperature T, and say radius R, little, small r, and this is a big source. Okay, it's a sun, that's it. And we have edge rays coming in this direction and also in this direction, both with a half acceptance angle of theta shown here, coming. And of course, this being a sphere will now emit light into a huge sphere. So we look at this little piece of that huge sphere shown by this, onto which we place some kind of a concentrator. We don't know what it is. We haven't defined the geometry, which has an input aperture of capital A1 and an output aperture of capital A2. Okay, let's say this is a concentrator on Earth. Now we can again make the same thermodynamic arguments um, in the exact same way uh, that the flux emitted by the spherical source is given by the surface area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared, multiplied by sigma, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, times fourth power of the temperature. Okay, simple. Again, the radiation captured by the entrance aperture, A1, is the total flux divided by the area of this huge sphere, okay, which you can again see in this vertical cut uh, image, basically a slice through the center of this three-dimensional image. You can see that's a circle, it's a, it's a sphere, of course, and it emits in this huge circle over here. So the flux is spread over this huge circle which is 4 pi d squared, d being the radius of that huge circle. So that's the flux per unit area on this huge circle multiplied by the area of the input aperture, A1. So that gives you the flux that is intercepted by the entrance aperture of the concentrator. Okay. Of course, the argument is that this flux that's captured under thermodynamic equilibrium should be equal to the flux um, uh, sorry a flux that is captured should be equal to the flux that is emitted okay we'll come to that in a second so this flux that is captured will get concentrated onto a black body at the exit aperture a2 at thermal equilibrium this black body heats up to a temperature t and the radiation that a2 emits must equal that it receives and because of the thermodynamic equilibrium and of course what it emits is shown here which is the area A2 sigma t raised to 4 and that should be equal to the flux that is captured which is the same as here and again 4 pi cancels out sigma cancels out uh, all you end up with is A1 divided by A2 equals d over r squared now d over r or r over d is nothing but sine theta from this right angle triangle so we can write a1 over a2 is 1 over sine squared theta. Okay, again we get a very simple expression that the ratio of the entrance aperture to the exit aperture is equal to 1 over sine squared theta. And of course the ratio of the entrance aperture to the exit aperture is a concentration factor. Okay, which basically means that in three dimensions the concentration factor A1 over A2 is given by 1 over sine squared theta, theta being the half acceptance angle. In two dimensions, A1 over A2 equals 1 over sine theta. So that's the basic difference. Okay, just like before, as this D gets very large, while R also gets large while maintaining theta, we can see that if this keeps going far and far away, this instead of being a, a, a circle will become a straight line. 
say one tends to be a flat surface. Not, not terribly important for us, but for a rigor rigorous proof, we need to uh, mention that. Okay. So, uh, okay. So again, just to drive home the point, what we are saying here is that when we do concentration in real life in three dimensions, you will end up with a concentration factor proportional one over sine squared of the acceptance angle. Whereas if you're designing a one-dimensional system, sometimes you, which might be in the case of a practical devices, for example, you had the parabolic trough concentrators, then the Fresnel one-dimensional concentrators, some of the teams talked about. In that situation, this concentration factor becomes one over sine theta, because that's a 2D. So you have to be careful where you apply this. Okay, there's one other thing you should be careful about in terms of uh, this uh, concentration factor. And this is a situation when the black body is immersed inside the concentrator whose refractive index is not air anymore. It is some material with refractive index N. Okay, what does this mean? This means that this concentrator we are looking at here is no longer hollow. It's filled with something, let's say glass or plastic or water or whatever. Okay, and in that situation, this whole concentration business becomes slightly different. And this is very simple to understand. It is comes from just the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Okay, there's some un deep underlying physics which we don't have time to talk about. Basically, for us, if you just look at the definition of sigma, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, there is a refractive index in there. In fact, there's a square of the refractive index in here. Okay, all of these are constants, of course, right? The case, the um, uh, the the Boltzmann constant and C naught is the speed of light, H is the Planck's constant, and all these are constants. N is, of course, the refractive index of the material. So you can say, see that the Stefan Boltzmann constant in some class, for example, is N squared times the Stefan Boltzmann constant in vacuum. So the key thing to keep in mind in a situation like this is that the receiver is now embedded inside some material of higher end refractive index, but the source is still in vacuum. Right, the sun is in space, whose refractive index is still 1. So in that situation, when we apply the equality of this equation here, where the flux intercepted by the concentrator is equal to the flux that's emitted from the receiver, you have to add basically an n squared term where the flux is emitted because it's emitted from a higher refractive index material. Here you still, have, you still can use the Stefan Boltzmann constant in vacuum. Okay, now everything else is the same, so 4 pi cancels out, uh, t raised to 4 cancels out, sigma v cancels out, and you, but you end up with an n squared. So a1 over a2, which is now the concentration factor ratio of areas, is now n squared divided by sine squared theta. Okay. Okay, now this is of course important because this means that now you have an additional parameter that you can use to increase concentration without giving up on the acceptance angle. In other words, you use material of higher refractive index, you can increase the concentration factor. So that's important. This result, of course, is in 3D. In 2D, this general result becomes very similar, A1 over A2, because N over sine theta. Okay. Uh, there is a very profound implication of this result is that in principle, by utilizing high, higher refractive index material, you can potentially get a concentration which is much larger than you could potentially get without using a higher refractive index material. And without going into much detail, I'll just point you to, um, oh, actually, before, before we go this, this idea of a high refractive index increasing the concentration is also simple to visualize if you just look at the 2D CPC. So imagine the CPC that we've been talking about for uh, the last couple of lectures is now filled with the material of reactive index N. What happens to this ray? Let's follow this. So this ray comes in, okay, this is air, and this is, say, refractive index N. Of course, it refracts. It follows Snell's law, right? It goes to a smaller angle, theta star, okay? The half angle is theta star, so full angle is 2 times theta star, and it refracts, reflects here, and ends up at the edge of the receiver. So the way to think about this is that 2 theta star, which is the inside acceptance angle, is less than 2 theta, which is the outside acceptance angle. And it's easy to see because sine theta is n times sine theta star. Right? That's just applying Snell's law at this interface here. 
and a1 sine theta star is a2. Why? Because that is basically the, the, the relation we computed a couple of slides ago for the concentration factor of the relating the input aperture and the output aperture of the CPC. So putting these two equations together, a1 over a2 is nothing but n over sine theta. Okay, so it's very, very easy to understand why you get this additional concentration. A profound implication of this is that you can potentially get extremely high concentrations by using a higher refractive index material. And again, without going into much detail, there's a very interesting paper which uh, was published in Nature in 1989, which essentially what it did was it produced an irradiance on Earth that exceeds that on the Sun's surface. Sorry, this is a typo. This should be Sun. So this is pretty incredible if you think about it, that you can produce an intensity on Earth that is higher than that on the Earth's, on the sun's surface. Okay, and the way this was done, by the way, te technically speaking, and that's the uh, that's the title, is basically they had a concentrator here, very similar to a parabolic concentrator, and then they had an additional secondary concentrator here, which is uh, if you zoom in, it is shown here. It's like a little lens, and that sent the device onto a, uh, essentially, a uh, it goes into solar cell in this case, they just wanted to measure the temperature. So uh, the, they sent it to what's called a calorimeter, and of course this has to be cooled and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is that the calorimeter was embedded in a high refractive index material. So what that ended up doing was that it was creating a temperature in here that was measured that was higher than the temperature of the surface of the sun which of course is incredible to imagine, but that's what they did. Uh, and this person, uh, Roland Winston, is the father of uh, non-imaging optics. He's still very active, he's still around. He's the guy who identified the CPC as, as, the, as the, this ideal concentrator. Okay, so with this, uh, I want to spend the rest of the class giving you some um, uh, examples of how concentrators can be applied uh, in, in, in various uh, various forms and I also want to take the rest of the class to do some practice problems which uh, of course will also be helpful for your exam and so on but uh, before we do that let's um, actually while we do this let's uh, stop and ask if there are any questions while I set this up. Are there any questions? Okay, so let's play this. There are two videos I want to show you, so I'm going to disconnect my audio for a second, so it will play. So, this is a very interesting project which I like because it was done by a young kid to essentially make a very, very, very simple uh, solar tracker. I won't show all of it, it's a little long, but I'll post a link to it. It's on a science fair, so. So, so you can see something very interesting here because this is, first of all, it doesn't use any external energy. It's still using the sun's energy to track the sun. So that's something beautiful about it. It's very elegant because it simply uses symmetry of the arrangement of these solar panels here. 
So it's a very, very, very simple but elegant example of innovation. So let's watch it a little bit more. This is a small motor connected to the solar cell. And this is how our, how our idea works. Now this is now turning clockwise. And when we reverse the wires, Okay, so there's a lot more uh, information there, but uh, I'll stop it right there. But again, you get an idea. So uh, again, the simplicity is, is, is something beautiful about this. Uh, so anyway, just an example. Since we talked a little bit about trackers last year, last time. Let me also show you one more example, a bit more complicated, about the tracker before we, we end, the, end the class. Uh, this is, by the way, a... Um, so I have a question is, can you improve on this? So, so the team, and I want all of you to think about this at the end of this class, by the way, I'm going to show you one more example, and I will pose an, a practice problem, a design problem, and I want you, while you're in class, to work uh, in together, uh, collaboratively, to come brainstorm and come up with some ways we can improve either this uh, or the next tracker that I'm going to show you or the problem that I'm going to post in, in, a, in a minute or so. Okay, so let, let's see the next example. This example, by the way, is something uh, that I took from a what's called an ARPA E Innovation Summit. Now, ARPA E is, uh, is an agency created by uh, the Bush administration, the last Bush, Bush administration as a as an uh, analog to DARPA. Now DARPA, some of you may be aware, is the agency that uh, uh, creates all the crazy ideas in technology. I mean, the internet was, of course, the initial forms of the internet was invented there. Um, so ARPA-E is basically the energy equivalent of this. And they have an innovation summit every year, and I actually attended a couple of those. And this is uh, from 2012, which uh, um, which um, shows a very interesting idea for a solo tracker. Again, just to spark ideas for you guys. So let me, sh let me run this. Well, everyone wants solar energy to be cheap, but right now it's not. And one of the reasons is uh, for the concentrated types of solar, the, you basically have a robot that has to point these solar panels or these mirrors at the sun to very high accuracy. And when you do that with metal and motors, at some point it ends up that the sol you kind of, it's not really a good trade-off to do solar anymore because you're using so many resources and you're doing it so expensively. And it's not really uh, accessible to most of the world. So we're working on a new form of solar tracker that's based on plastic and water actuators as opposed to the traditional metal and motor based actuators. This is the actuator we're basing our uh, solar trackers on. We call them heliostats because they follow the sun. Over here we have a very small scale version of our array and uh, our actual array would maybe have a hundred mirrors this size. And these mirrors are much smaller than what's out in the field right now. And there's a lot of advantages to that. One of them is the closer you get to the ground, the less wind loading is a problem. And because it's so lightweight, start thinking about putting concentrated power on rooftops, places where we haven't been able to do it before because it's such a heavy, uh, heavy, heavy system. One of the mirrors on this array is demonstrating movement, and the movement is happening just by distributing water to each of the chambers.
okay so at this point I want to uh, have you um, work as a team uh, in the rest of the class you have about uh, let's see about 10 uh, 20 minutes left um, to design a concentrator that concentrates sunlight into a ring shape not to us not to a spot okay brainstorm and see if you can come up with the solution and uh, I want you to talk uh, uh, you know if, as a group and discuss and brainstorm and write on, draw on the board and an arrange will guide the discussion and if you're done with that please also think about how you could potentially improve a very simple idea like this how can you improve this okay and this again my goal here is for to give you some practice on how to do brainstorming and coming up with new ideas but also this is an interesting exercise so so give it a shot uh, and also I posted a very interesting TED talk from Bill Gross uh, I would highly recommend you to take a look at it and I posted a link to it uh, he talks about solar uh, concentrators and trackers and so on but and it's very interesting so so I, I won't play it because it's long but uh, I will stop here and I will let Naren take over a discussion about about this particular problem. Uh, okay, Naren. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording, and I will sign off.